Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Alan Gray. I'm a member of the Rotary Club of Yonkers East Yonkers. I am also the chair of our speech contest committee, and I am delighted to welcome you to this information session on our second annual youth speech contest. We started this contest last year, and at that point, we didn't know what kind of interest we were going to have, so we had it only open to high schoolers. And thankfully, we've gotten a lot of interest. We had a lot of people who wanted to participate. And so we've opened it up now to all age groups. We hope that you will enjoy participating. We hope that you will encourage others uh, in your classes, in your communities, in your neighborhoods to compete as well. And we hope that you get something out of this. Only three people in each division will be able to go home with some cash prizes, but we hope that everyone will enjoy the experience of competing. We hope that you'll learn something about yourself, about these topics, and that you'll grow as speakers. Tonight, I'm going to try to cover three broad topics. First, I'm going to review the structure of the contest itself. Second, I'll review some suggestions and things to consider as you go about writing your speech for the contest. And finally, I'll review some practice tips for when you're delivering your speech. I will apologize to each of you in here and watching the recording for my voice. I'm just getting over a head cold, so I don't have the best voice for public speaking. <clears throat> so pardon me as I clear my throat. Don't use me as a model tonight for how to deliver your speeches, but I hope uh, that it, it won't detract too much from what we'll cover tonight. So let me begin by just reviewing the overall structure of the contest. And as I mentioned, this year's contest is open to all age groups, K through 12, and it's open to students who live in Yonkers or go to school in Yonkers. So if you live in Yonkers, but you go to school somewhere else, you're eligible to participate. And if you live somewhere else but go to school in Yonkers, you're also eligible to participate. We recognize our community comes from all over the New York metropolitan area. So if you live in one of the two, live in Yonkers or go to school in Yonkers, you're eligible to participate. Our K through eight students, our elementary and middle school students, are going to be speaking on the topic if you were the mayor of Yonkers, what would be your top priority in office and why. And this is an election year when we are going to have an election for the mayor of Yonkers. And so this is a chance for each of our K through eight students to uh, have their say on what they would do if they were running for the mayor of Yonkers. Our elementary school students, our kindergarten through fifth grade students are gonna be asked to deliver a three to five minute speech on that topic. And our middle school students, our uh, sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders, will be delivering a five to seven minute speech on that topic. For our high school students, the topics are, you I have a choice of your topic. You can choose either to answer the question, what should the role of the courts be to protect your rights in school? Or what should the role of the courts be to protect the safety of everyone in the community. And I should say, if you're wondering why these questions seem a little different for high schoolers, we're very grateful to our co-sponsors this year, which are the Historical Society of the New York State Courts. They have a scholarship fund that they use to promote the um, academic engagement of students relative to the courts, thinking about the role of the courts in their community. And so we're delighted to be partnering with them this year for this contest. And so these are the, the topics that they have proposed. And as I go through the materials in, in a few moments, uh, the, these topics are very broad, but with the high school students, we have some resources online to maybe give you some ideas of where to start with, with your research and thinking about how to write your speech. So I'll, I'll point you to that information in just a moment. One of the big changes that we made this year in organizing our contest was to make it asynchronous, meaning that instead of coming to us and delivering your speeches in person for the preliminary portion of the competition, you'll instead record a video of you delivering your speech and you'll upload that to us. 
one of the reasons that we did that was to make it easier for all of you so that if you another job or were taking care of a family member just were busy with school work we were, we did this on a school night last year that that was difficult for some people and we wanted to make this as accessible as possible so you control when you deliver your speech if you're ready to record your speech at the end of watching this video or participating in this session for those of you who are here with me live you can do that if you want to wait until 11 p.m. on uh, Friday, March 31st. I wouldn't recommend that, but if that's what you want to do, you're free to do that. So you have control over when is best for you to deliver your speech, to record it, and to upload it. The other reason that we did it uh, and decided to do it this way was to make sure that we had enough people to judge because each of your speeches are gonna be scored and evaluated. And we wanted to make sure that we had good people doing that who could give you the time and attention that you deserve in order to do that. So we, for those reasons and several others as well, that's why we thought it best. Now our final round, those students who are in the top three in each age group are gonna be invited to come and deliver their speeches in person at City Hall on Wednesday, April 26th, and that's where you'll compete for those cash prizes. So there is still an in-person component to it, but we, again, incorporated this video recording element to try to open it up to as many people as possible. So let me go through some of the rules to give you some ideas of the framework, the, the boundaries that you're writing this speech in because I know I'm someone who I could go on and on on any subject if I was given the opportunity. So to give you some, some idea as to the framework for uh, writing your speech, some of the things you should keep in mind. I've given you the time limits on each of the speeches, elementary school students, three to five minutes, middle and high school students, five to seven minutes. There is a 30 second grace period on each of those time limits. So in other words, you earn points as long as your speech is for elementary school students within two minutes and 30 seconds or um, five minutes and 30 seconds. So as long as you're within 30 seconds on either side of that three to five minute mark, you're okay. And for our middle and, and high school students, the five to seven minutes, again, 30 seconds on either side. So as long as your speech is between four minutes and 30 seconds, seven minutes and 30 seconds, as long as you're somewhere in there, you're perfect. And we, we put those grace periods in because things happen when you're delivering a speech. Again, this is recorded, so you can rehearse it as many times as you want, but something may happen. You might decide your best take. You had a sneeze in the middle of it, something like that. That's okay, that, things like that happen. So if, if your speech in whatever recording you decide to submit falls within one of those grace periods, you're still okay. We have in the rules, and if I didn't say it before, I'll say it again in the chat, which I'll put um, again for those of you who are here with me live. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll find the link to an information packet in the comment section, or excuse me, in the description uh, for this video. You'll find a link to that that I've shared with everyone who's here with us today. In this packet, we have, among other things, the rules for the contest, and we've put some guidance in there for you on how to um, record your video, what kinds of formats we're looking for. But essentially, we have a red, the, the red, uh, registration form, which is the link to which it's bit.ly slash Yonkers Rotary YSC register. And that's the form you'll use whenever either you are ready to upload the video of um, your speech if you if you decide to record it yourself or if you don't feel comfortable recording yourself for any reason maybe you don't have a good setup at home you can't find a good place to do it at school whatever it may be or you just don't even feel like it that's okay too you'll have the option when you register on that registration form to instead select a day and a time that works for you to come to the Yonkers Library, we, I'm fairly certain it's going to be the, the Riverfront Library, and we'll record it for you. 
So if you would rather have someone else, me, it'll be me <laughs> recording it. If you'd rather have me record your speech for you so that you don't even have to worry about it, that's absolutely fine. We're more than happy to do that. And we will work with you if you have technical issues, if you're having trouble finding a space or a time, please reach out to us. Again, we want to be accommodating. We want to be accessible. So you can always email me at speechcontest at yonkersrotary.org. I'm the one who gets those emails. I will respond to you as quickly as I am able. So we please, if you're having trouble or having difficulties, please reach out and I will work with you as best we can to make sure that you're able to participate. So again, you can either have the, the Rotary Club record your speech for you, or if you're comfortable recording it yourself, you're more than welcome to do so. And on that registration form, you'll either upload the video if you choose to record it yourself, or uh, you'll, you'll pick the time uh, if you wanna have us record it for you. So all recordings are due however you choose to do it by 11.59 p.m. on Friday, March 31st. So we're going right up to midnight. You can choose to submit it. Again, I don't recommend that, but if, you, uh, if, if you're someone who likes to do that, uh, you, you will give you that opportunity. Once that time closed, and again, you can submit your videos anytime before that. You can submit them tonight, tomorrow, this weekend, you can, anytime between now and March 31st you're free to go ahead and register and submit your videos. Once we have closed that registration uh, time, that time to have your video recorded or uploaded, we will start the scoring process. And we anticipate that to take about a week. It will depend on how many students enter and how many judges we have. We are guaranteeing that every student will be scored by at least three judges. Now, if we happen to have more judges and everyone can be scored by four, then, then certainly more feedback is always welcome. Um, but everyone will be scored by the same amount of judges. So it's not like some people will be scored by four and some by three. Everyone will be scored by the same amount of judges, and that will at least be three judges. And you have in that packet as well a copy of the score sheet and the criteria that you'll be evaluated on. About half of the criteria focus on the content of your speech your introduction, your content, your organization, your use of support, and your conclusion. The other half focus on your delivery, how well you spoke. Things like your vocal delivery, your facial delivery, how expressive you were with your face, your physical delivery, how expressive you were with your body, any dramatic or rhetorical effect that you may have used. And again, your time management, and this is where those um, uh, the, the timing comes in with your time period. And you'll note the score sheet that is in your packet uh, uses the four minutes and 30 seconds and the seven minutes and 30 seconds for the middle and high schoolers. Obviously for elementary school students, we'll change that to the, the right time period. So those will be scored by our judges. Again, should take about a week. If we get it done sooner, we'll release the results sooner and we'll announce our, our three people in each division that are moving on to the final round. And so that final round, as I mentioned earlier, will be Wednesday, April 26th at City Hall. And this time, everyone will be judged by a panel of five judges, all new judges, none of whom will have seen any of the speeches before. And you'll, you'll deliver your speeches in person. So everyone who comes to the final round is going home with some money. The question is how much money you'll be going home with. Uh, and we hope to have a reception afterwards that we hope you'll join us for as well. So with that, let me talk a little bit next about the um, video recording. Some of the things to think about and how you actually go about recording your speech if you choose to do it yourself. Again, if you choose to have the Rotary Club record it for you, we will take care of as many of these things as possible. But these are some considerations to keep in mind if you choose to record your speech yourself. One thing we are suggesting is that, well, first of all, the, all recordings should not be edited at all in any way. That means if, if you are recording this entirely yourself with no one helping you, that means that part of the video will show you coming up, hitting record, stepping back, delivering your speech, coming up, hitting stop. That's okay. That's, that's all fine. Our judges are going to be given information and instructions before they start scoring. They're going to be told to disregard things like that. Reason being, we want to hear how well you are as a speaker. We don't want to see how well you are as a video editor. 
That's not what this contest is about. So we understand that the, the recordings might not be perfect, and that's okay. Our judges are going to be told, disregard that. This is what the students were told. They should not be penalized for that. You want to additionally try to avoid using a virtual background, which is what I'm using. And the reason you want to do that is because you'll see, as even though my hand is up, it it's comes in and out of frame. So you want to try to use not uh, avoid using a virtual background, and instead just try to use a neutral background behind you. It could be an empty wall, it could be a door, anything you're comfortable with. Uh, again, we understand not everyone has a bunch of blank walls in their home that they can use for something like this. So our judges are going to be told to try to not take that into account, not let that affect them. But you want to have as few distractions as possible. We have a lot of questions about attire, or standing or sitting, things like that. And this is a public speaking competition. Um, the Rotary Club is a professional organization, so we encourage you to, to wear business attire when you're delivering this. We understand not everyone has business attire, so that's okay. The main thing we suggest in terms of how you dress for these recordings is to avoid anything distracting. For example, I wouldn't want to deliver a speech or be speaking with you all tonight wearing, for example, a t-shirt with profanity on it. That I don't feel like that would be appropriate for me to deliver this speech. It probably wouldn't be appropriate for your speech as well. In terms of standing or sitting, again, I, I think, as I'll talk about towards the end, I think we're all more effective, more um, expressive when we're standing while we're speaking. Not everyone is able to do that for whatever reason. Maybe you're mobility impaired. Maybe your camera setup, if you're choosing to do this yourself, just doesn't afford you that opportunity. That, that's okay. We understand that. It's entirely up to you. However you think is the best way to present your speech is absolutely how you should do it. In terms of framing yourself, you do want to leave enough space within the frame in order for your full range of expression to be captured. So I'm sitting at my desk delivering the, these remarks to you. I may be a foot and a half to two feet between my body and my webcam. If I was delivering my speech, I probably want to step back a little further so that you could see my posture and my body language, things like that. And again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how to use that effectively um, towards the end of these remarks. But you want to make sure that wherever you are in the frame, if you're recording this yourself, that you're, you can be fully seen. That doesn't mean we need to see your toes. You don't have to go that far back so that we can see you from top to bottom. Something like from the waist up is probably the most effective position to record that in. Our rules, and everything I'm saying is also within uh, our rules too. So this is this is not uh, you know me kind of making things up. Again, we, we don't want to know how effective you are at staging a scene. So avoid using any artificial lighting, props or backgrounds, things of that nature. Um, you do want to make sure you're well lit. You want to make sure that you can be seen in your camera, but you don't need studio lighting. You don't need to ask your, your school to borrow their auditorium, things like that. Just natural room lighting, somewhere that you can be fully seen will, will suffice for this. Um, other people can be with you while you are filming. You don't have to do this entirely alone. You can have other people in the room with you, but the other people in the room with you should not be heard or seen in the recording. Again, we solely want to focus on you, on your speech. We don't want to hear how funny your audience thinks you are and hear them laughing. We don't want to hear them encouraging you, things like that. We just want to hear you speaking and, and see you speaking. People also ask me about um, whether they should memorize their speech or whether they can read their speech. And in our rules, what we say is that speeches are meant to be delivered and not read. So certainly if you need to use notes in order to deliver your speech, that, that's up to you whether you feel that need. Um, if I were competing in this contest, and again, I'm not judging or scoring this contest, and we are not telling our judges that you should have it memorized, they are getting the same rules that you are. Um, me personally, if I was competing in this contest, I would try to have it memorized. That said, again, if you want or need to use notes, you are absolutely free to do so. The point is that they simply shouldn't detract 
from your speech because you want to be making effective eye contact, you want to be engaging as much as possible. So try to avoid kind of having a script from which you're, you're reading your notes. Again, if you want to use notes, that's fine. If you want to speak from behind a lectern, that's also absolutely fine. Um, for example, if you're working with a teacher on the speech contest and they have a lectern or a podium in their classroom or at your school, um, or even if you come to the library or you go to the library on your own and want to record this, you absolutely um, may use a lectern if you would like to. Again, absolutely not required, but certainly permitted. Um, I, I'm trying to think, I think, again, I, you, you have the rules so you can read them in, in, um, your, in their entirety on your own. Um, but let me pause for a moment and ask any of those um, who are here with me live, if any of you have any questions about the rules um, or about the contest. Okay, well, and again, if any questions come up, you can always email me speechcontest at yonkersrotary.org and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. If any rules changes happen, Additionally, we will um, email everybody and, and let them know. We'll post those updated rules on our website. I don't expect that that will happen, um, but if, if a question was asked that warranted some clarification to everybody, then we would make sure that everybody knew that information. So no one is getting an unfair advantage in this contest. So let me shift now to um, the speech writing and the public speaking portion of this um, session, or I guess we'll transfer from the information session part to the workshop part. And before I do, I want to share with you um, something that's on the very first page of the information packet that, again, is in the chat for those of you here with me on Zoom, and that is in the description section on uh, YouTube. On the very first page, I've given you three links and three QR codes. The first two links are to, uh, one, the first link is to the um, information sign up form. That's if you would just like to give me your contact information before you actually register for the contest so that I can keep you updated, for example, on any information or rule changes, clarifying questions, updates, things like that. The second link is the registration form. And again, that's what you'll use when you're ready either to upload your speech or to uh, schedule a time to have your speech recorded. But the third link uh, and the third QR code is to something called Udly. And as I've noted there, it is for a AI public speaking coach. So let me take a moment just to tell you what Udly is. And this is a tool that I actually use myself when I am practicing a for a speech and I'm preparing for a speech. Udly is, as it says, it's an artificial intelligence-based public speaking coach. It is completely free. The link that you have there is to the sign up form uh, that I've provided. I get no benefit whether you sign up or not. So this is not me pushing a product on you. This is just me sharing a resource that I found to be helpful since I've started using it for about a year and a half now. What Udly does is it is a website that allows you to go on and either record a speech live or upload a recording of a speech. And based on that recording, Udly will first transcribe the speech, it will write out everything that you said, and it will analyze how you spoke and give you feedback on it. For example, if I were positioned off to the side, one of the feedback pieces of information that it would give me is, you were mispositioned in the frame, you should try to speak from the center. It would give me insight into how well I spoke, whether I could have spoken more efficiently or spoken more strongly, if there was a way I could have rephrased something to be more clear. It'll give me feedback on my filler words, my ums, uhs, likes, and so's. So is a hard one for me personally, <laughs> just to share some inside information for you. It will give me feedback on my use of inclusive language, as opposed to using guys or girls saying things like folks or everyone. So it gives a lot of really invaluable information, things that even when I'm practicing in front of a mirror, I, I don't get the benefit of. So uh, again, I'm sharing this with you in the hopes that you find it helpful. I use it first in the speech writing process. I might deliver a speech impromptu 
and then use the write up of my speech to kind of look back on it and think, hmm, is there a better way I could have said this or explained it? And then once I'm closer to the final draft of my speech, I'll use it again as I'm practicing and rehearsing. How much eye contact was I making with my camera? How many times was I saying um and ah? Uh? Were my hand gestures effective? Another personal problem of mine, was I talking too fast? Which is a, a bad habit. I Sometimes I talk way too fast. I hope that's not your experience watching here today. So Udly gives me a lot of this valuable feedback. I, I hope that some of you uh, find it helpful. And again, uh, it's, it, it's simply a, a resource that I'm sharing with you uh, that I, I hope you enjoy to use. And again, completely free. No, no, uh, no payment required. So now, given all of that information, how do we think about speaking effectively? And how do we think about writing a speech effectively? And I'll note the last few pages of the packet that I have here are um, some resources that we put together last year for um, speech writing, public speaking, and then some sample speeches. If you wanted to take a look at some speeches that other people have given, we some that we thought were some particularly good examples of public speaking. Again, we're not saying these are the rules that you have to follow. We just wanted to provide some resources for you. But all of that being said, to start with speech writing, how do we go about writing an effective speech? First, we have to decide what we're going to say. And so I always go back to the topic that I'm, I'm speaking about. So again, for our kindergartners through eighth graders, if you were the mayor of Yonkers, what would be your top priority in office and why? And if you're in high school, one of those two questions. What should the role of the courts be to protect your rights in school? Or what should the role of the courts be to protect the safety of everyone in the community? And I always start just thinking about it, brainstorming, considering that topic and coming up with ideas. Everyone's process on that part is different. Some people like to kind of sketch out, write out their ideas. Some will do a word cloud. Some will do a kind of stream of consciousness, almost a journal entry kind of thing, thinking about it. Everyone's process on that initial brainstorming part is different. Personally, I will just kind of mull it over throughout my day. And I actually have a speech I'm working on now where that's exactly what I spent some time doing this morning on my commute. Just kind of thinking about how I might approach a particular topic I have to speak about. And eventually, you will want to settle on, on an answer to the question that you have. And, and that's what your speech should be about, your answer to that question. And my suggestion in writing a speech is to pick something that you personally believe. It's always easier to talk about something that we genuinely believe in, that we genuinely agree with, rather than going out and thinking about what we think an impressive answer might be or what the right answer might be. Instead, pick an answer that you personally believe in, because when we th think about how we deliver our speech, we'll find that we tend to be a lot more expressive and we tend to engage with it a lot more when it's something that we believe in, rather than when it's something that we're trying to talk about just to impress someone else. But once you have an answer to that question, you then want to start doing some research thinking about it. And research is a very broad term. It could actually be searching around on the internet or going to your library or speaking with experts. You, you could do all of those things. It might not necessarily be that. It might, again, just be a kind of brainstorming process. So if you were the mayor of Yonkers and what your top priority would be, you might simply have to just spend some time thinking about the reasons why you might want your particular thing to be your type priority in office. Or if you're in one of our high school contestants, you might just be thinking about what your experience with the court system is, if you've ever had any, or the experience of someone you know in the court system and what that might look like. So simply thinking about the reasons you might talk about a topic and then starting to think about some of the support. That's the part where you might do some research. So you might do some research into, for our high school students, what the law is with regard to your rights in school. What are your rights in school? You might want to go find out first. Or how do courts protect the safety of the people in the community at all? You might want to think about that 
and take a look around. And I will pause to note here for our high school students, if you look at the Historical Society of the New York State Courts website, which is history.nycourts.gov, and again, there are links to it in the materials that in the packet that you have, we've actually done a, a head start for you with your research. You can go there and find some information that we've pulled to give you a, a start on your research, depending on which question you choose, some resources to point you in the right direction. You certainly don't have to use those resources, but we hope that you'll find them helpful as you start your work on your speech. For our middle school students, again, depending on the answer that you choose, what your top priority in office might be, you, you, your kind of research might vary. And I will um, use an example from one of our, uh, we, we invited someone to speak. We had a third grader reach out to us last year who desperately wanted to participate. And so we invited her to come as a guest speaker to, to deliver her speech. And when she, uh, the question was what she wanted to see improved in Yonkers. And one of the things she talked about was that Yonkers needed a zoo. And if that was what you believe, then you might think about, well, why does Yonkers need a zoo? What benefit would that bring to Yonkers? What might be some of the challenges in bringing that to Yonkers? So once you've got your answer to your question, you then wanna to start to think about the reasons that support your answer to your question. And you want to think about the support that underlies those reasons. So that support could be news articles. It could be interviews. It could be your own personal experiences. Any information or evidence or analysis that would support the reasons that justify your answer to your question. And again, all of that can vary. This is one of those reasons that speech writing and public speaking is part art and part science. There are some general frameworks, some general rules that we want to think about when we are writing a speech, but there's a lot of flexibility within that, and there, there are not a whole lot of right and wrong answers. But you do want to make sure that you have some reasons to support your answer, and you do want to make sure you have some support for each of those reasons. So once you kind of have what sounds like at this point a big jumble of reasons and research and personal experiences and newspaper clippings, if anyone still clips the newspaper anymore. I used to when I was in high school doing these contests. I don't know if anyone does anymore. But whatever your process is, that's when you then wanna start organizing it. And for most people, I simply recommend the five paragraph essay structure that everyone was probably taught in their English class at some point or another. The idea is you start with an introduction, something that grabs your audience's attention, presents the question about which you're speaking, gives your answer to that question, as well as previews the reasons that support your answer to that question. You then have your, your body, typically three paragraphs if we were doing a five paragraph essay, and each paragraph devoted to one of those reasons. And in those paragraphs, you would explain the reason, you would discuss, your support for it, then you'd again explain what that, what that support means and why it justifies you, the reason for your answer. And again, each of those might be devoted to one of the uh, reasons that you have for your answer. And finally, you'd have a conclusion where you, again, remind your audience what the question is that you've been talking about for a few minutes, what your answer to that question was, what your reasons were for that that answer, and conclude with, my speech coach used to call it a zinger, something that leaves your audience with something to think about. That might be what we call a call to action, encouraging your audience to go out and do something with the information that you've given them. It could be something simply profound for them to think about. Anything that kind of rings a bell that leaves your audience kind of reeling from your speech thinking, wow, that was great. I, I learned something from that, or I feel a little bit better having listened to that speech. Now, again, that's a suggestion, this kind of what I call the five paragraph essay kind of structure. You absolutely don't have to do that. You might find that the best way to answer the question for your category or your division, your age group, is by telling a story. Certainly, that can be an effective way of public speaking. You might present the question and your answer to it, and you might tell a story that explains and 
by telling that story justifies your answer to the question. That is absolutely an acceptable way to do that. And your story might end with some kind of moral or lesson that you learned that from which you understand and appreciate the answer to, to the question that you're answering. That is an absolutely acceptable way to deliver a speech of, of this nature. So uh, I don't want to feel like you have, you're pressured into doing this kind of five paragraph essay sort of format. Um, again, I think that might be the most accessible way to do it and the most organized way of doing it. But this is again, part of the process that is open to your creativity. So feel free to structure your speech differently if you feel like there's a different way that would better support you as a public speaker. When you're writing your speech as well, you also do want to think about some of the word choice or sentence structure. Give some thought, not just as to when you're writing it, whether you are conveying the information that you want to convey, but also is your audience going to receive it the way you intend it? English is one of these tricky languages where I can say one thing and completely change its meaning by the emphasis I, I put on a particular word in a sentence. So your word choice may make a difference, or you might find stronger ways to express certain ideas if you stop and reflect for a moment on how effectively you have written certain parts of your speech. So certainly once you've written it out, you do wanna take a moment to look back on it. Is this the most effective way that I could convey all of this information, that I could say all of this, and then perhaps make some changes or tweaks or edits. So those are some kind of broad suggestions that I have for speech writing. Again, I'm, I'm don't wanna go into too much detail because I don't want anyone watching to feel again like there is a specific right way that you have to write this speech because there's not. Um, it is however you feel best supports you expressing yourself and conveying your message. Um, but I hope that this is a little bit helpful on speech writing. And so before I turn into some thoughts on public speaking, I wanna ask if anyone here on Zoom with me has any questions or, or comments that they might like to share. Or questions they might like to ask, comments they might like to share. Okay. Um, I read somewhere that you should wait 10 seconds before you move on. So that's why the long pauses. So now let me talk about the actual public speaking part of it. You have this speech that you, you think is a good speech, and now you stand up to deliver it. What's the, what are the things to think about when you're doing it, when you're actually standing in front of the camera delivering it? And there, are, I, I believe, the way I, I discuss this whenever I'm teaching this, is that there are two parts to um, public speaking. First, there's what you say, and then there's how you say it. And we've already talked about the what you say part, that's the speech writing part. The how you say it part is what we'll focus on now. And under that umbrella, I think there are two other things to think about. One is how you say it with your voice, and the other is how you say it with your body. So let's start with how you say it with your voice. And this is things like tone, pitch, and speed, I think are typically the, the three main categories when we talk about vocal delivery. First of all, in terms of pace, in general, you wanna make sure that you're speaking at a pace where your audience can understand you. Remember that your judges are going to be multitasking. They're not only going to be watching and listening to you, but they also have to complete your score sheet. So if you're speaking too quickly, your judges or your scores might miss something that, that you said. They might miss an idea that you were expressing. On the other hand, if you speak too slow, your judges might get bored and fall asleep. I'm kidding, they won't actually fall asleep, but it may extend what you're trying to say in an unnecessary way. And it might actually inhibit the message that you're trying to affect. However, you can speed up or slow down at different parts of your speech in order to express different ideas. For example, if I'm really excited about something and I wanna tell you how much it means to me and how important it is, 
I might speed up my pitch. But if I wanted to emphasize very seriously a particular point, I might slow down and put emphasis on those different parts, those different words or different clauses in a sentence. So certainly there are times where you might want to speed up or slow down in order to emphasize what it is that you're saying. You are ultimately the judge of when to use that tactic. You're the one who has to decide this is a great point for me to speed up, or this is a great point for me to slow down, or this is a great point for me to just speak in a completely normal speed. So there's no bright line rule as to when you should do one thing or the other. It is entirely up to you. Another part of vocal delivery is your pitch, and that is how high you go and how low you go. And it's a little hard for me to, I'm gonna to try to demonstrate as best I can. It's a little bit hard with me losing my voice because of this head cold. But for example, again, if I'm really excited about something and I wanna convey how excited I am, I might raise my pitch. Or even if I wanted to say maybe how crazy something is, I might go up in voice. Or if I wanted to be really serious, or maybe I'm really sad, then those might be times where I would lower the tone of my voice. Again, it is up to you how you decide, and you might then pick sort of a neutral pitch and, and in order to especially demonstrate the contrast between your highs and your lows. You might pick an, a normal kind of pitch. You might say, this is a good time. I'm just conveying information here. I don't want to go up or down. I, I wanna just be neutral. How and when, or if at all, you decide to do that is entirely up to you. So those are some things to think about with your voice, how you're speaking with your voice. How you speak with your body is a little more complicated because much of what we communicate with our body is um, unconscious, subconscious. It often is not something that we're thinking about doing. To use myself as an example, I am very expressive with my hands. If you haven't noticed from the recording already, I tend to talk a lot with my hands. And so one of the things I have to think about when I'm delivering a speech is actually to use my hands less. I have to try to use my hands only to emphasize particular important points. Other people may have the opposite challenge. They may not feel naturally like they use their hands a lot at all when they speak. And so for them, using their hands more might be the challenge, remembering, oh, this is a point where I could make a certain hand gesture. What kind of hand gestures might work? Well, uh, to, to emphasize specific things, I might make my hands small. I might make a, a specific kind of point, scrunching my hands into a little ball. If I wanted to talk about how, how big something is, I might open my hands and spread my fingers and, and really emphasize how big they are. If I wanted to indicate how something was moving from one thing to another, I might make you know, an A and a B kind of gesture. I might make a sweeping gesture. There are all different ways that we can use our hands to visually represent the information that it is that we're conveying. We might also count off one thing, a second thing, a third thing. We might make a demonstration, like a, if I needed to make a triangle or something or talk about how really small something is. Again, the ways you could use your hands while you're public speaking are practically limitless. So it's entirely up to you to decide when is an appropriate place to gesture with my hands and what might an appropriate hand gesture be. And again, for me, the challenge personally is knowing when not to gesture. These are times not to gesture. And then these are times where it's okay for me to gesture. Again. Everyone's challenges coming into this will be very different, but it's up to you again, how you choose to use that tool. Now you've probably noticed that as I've talked about my tone and my pitch, my vocal delivery, and even as I was gesturing with my hands, you probably saw a few different parts, uh, a few different other parts of my physical delivery. These were things like my position to the camera, how I might lean in to try to be a little more intimate with you, to tell you a secret, but I might back up to tell you something really big or really serious or to expand on something. So that's how I might use um, my positioning from the camera. 
Posture is a little bit diff difficult for me to demonstrate sitting down, but posture is another thing that you can use effectively. Generally, when you're speaking, the idea is to start with your feet roughly shoulder width apart and standing up straight with your, with your shoulders wide and to have a kind of commanding presence in front of your audience. But you might want to move away from that, again, depending on what it is that you're, you're saying. So again, if I'm talking about something really small or really specific, I might bend forward or bend over. To, if I was standing up, I might bend over. I might bring my shoulders in close together. Things like that might accentuate that I'm talking about something small or really specific. Or it could be something bad, depending on what it is that I'm communicating. On the other hand, I might even broaden my chest really big. If I'm saying, look how, you know, how big this massive thing is, broadening my, my chest and, and shoulders even more, arching my back a little bit more. All of, all of this might be something I would use to convey how big something is. So while you, again, probably want to have a calm and commanding neutral posture, you might want to mess with that or change that depending on how it is um, that you're speaking, what it is that you're speaking about, the specific points that you're communicating. You probably also have noticed by now my facial expressions. So again, talking about something really small or really specific, I might scrunch my face. If I'm really surprised about something, I might widen my eyes and lift my eyebrows and speak really widely with my, make my mouth really wide. Again, the, and by the way, I'm, I'm kind of showcasing the extremes for you. There are lots of things in between, even just on facial expressions, for instance. Maybe something's really puzzling and you just want to raise one eyebrow. I mean, again, we have, as human beings, a whole range of ways that we can express ourselves. And it is entirely up to you how you choose to do that. So I'm giving you kind of some extremes here, but there's lots of room in between that you can work with. The One of the last things that I will talk about in terms of your physical delivery, and this is both very important and very challenging, as I'm sure you've all noticed during since the, the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020, when we lots of us shifted either our, our schooling or our, war, our jobs became remote, and that's eye contact. And in particular, when you are speaking with a, a to a camera, you want to make sure to make eye contact with the camera. So on Zoom, a lot of people, if I move forward a little bit so you can see them, I, I look at one of the pictures of, of the people that's here with us on my screen. I'm looking at that picture, but I'm not making eye contact with the camera. So for everybody else watching, whether you're watching here on Zoom or whether you're watching the recording, me looking down at the person on my screen seems to you as though I'm not making eye contact with you. So it's important to make eye contact with the camera to the fullest extent possible. And it feels weird because the camera is a thing. It's not a person. We can't gauge its reaction while we're speaking to it. That's one of the things that makes communication so wonderful about being a human being is that we are so expressive and communicative with our eyes. So if we're missing that, then it's very challenging for us to communicate to an inanimate object. But do your best to remember that on the other end of that camera, uh, some time away from after you record it, is going to be another human being. And that your making eye contact with the camera is going to be a lot more effective. Now, I will say when you're speaking in person, as those of you who advance to our final round will be, you want to make sure to make eye contact and meaningful eye contact with your entire audience. So, for example, if your audience is an entire room full of people, you want to make sure to look around the room and make eye contact with every person in that audience so that your entire audience feels like they're on the receiving end of your speech. And that's what I'm trying to demonstrate. I don't know how effectively it looks on your end, but trying to demonstrate what it might look like to look around your audience. And I emphasize the idea of meaningful eye contact because what some people will do in that setting where they, they have a big audience is they might just kind of look back and forth, almost like a sprinkler, 
just kind of back and forth across their audience. And that's not necessarily the most effective approach because then it's so brief and fleeting that no one in the audience in particular feels like they're being connected to. So my suggestion usually when I'm working with someone who's going to be speaking in, in front of a, a larger live audience is usually to break up their eye contact either by sentences or by parts of a sentence. So I might start one part of a sentence looking at one person. I might look to another person for another part of a sentence. I might look to a third person for a third part of a sentence or a third sentence altogether, come back to another person. It's largely how you feel comfortable executing it. But the idea is you do wanna make eye contact with individual people in your audience some meaningful amount of time for them to feel like you're speaking to them because you are. And so you want your audience to be sure to, to feel that way. One final note I'll give on being nervous because uh, Jerry Seinfeld has a joke that more people are afraid of public speaking than they are of dying. That's not the joke part because that's actually true. The joke is that more people would rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy. And that is absolutely understandable. Public speaking is something that terrifies more people on this planet than anything else. So it might feel a little easier for you as well if you're just speaking to a camera or one or two people behind the camera. Um, but how might you deal with speaking to an, a larger audience? Whether you advance to the final round or not, because most of, most of us will at some point or another in our lives have an opportunity just to speak to a group of people. So how do you deal with that? There are a, a couple suggestions I, I offer when I'm speaking with someone who has those kind of fears or worries. One suggestion is to try to think about public speaking as a conversation. In other words, each of us every day has conversations with dozens of people in our lives. And very rarely, do we get nervous just having those one-on-one -on -one conversations? So try to conceive of public speaking that way. You're just having a conversation with one person. Sometimes uh, if I'm, I'm the person I'm working with, if I know I'm gonna be in the audience, I'll say, I'll stand at the back of the room and just talk to me. Just look at me and talk to me, have a conversation with me. Forget about everyone else in the room, just have a conversation with me. Some people, that, that idea feels helpful. They can, they can relate to the idea of, I don't have trouble having one-on-one -on -one conversations. So why don't I just imagine I'm only having a conversation with one person and, and pretend that nobody else is there? For some people, that's not very helpful advice. Some people feel nervous be, they, because they, they feel the eyes of everyone on them and they describe it that way. They, they feel everybody watching them and, and that's what makes them nervous. For some of those people, what I try to suggest is instead of making direct eye contact with people in their audience is to skim the top of their heads. Just look right above their heads. Or if you have the opportunity, pick points on the wall around the room where people are going to be. And instead of making eye contact with actual people or even, even looking at their heads, make eye contact with those specific points on the wall. And so you, you're delivering your speech, not to any one person in this general direction, but to a particular spot in the wall. And then same thing over here and same thing over there. This is actually something a lot of politicians use. If you've ever noticed that many of them may speak at lecterns and you may not see them flipping through notes, but they're using teleprompters, which are little scripts off to the, their, the sides of them. And so they're actually just looking off to one side and reading the text that's on one teleprompter, they'll look to the right and they'll read the text that's on the other side of the teleprompter. They may not ever look at, an, at a human being in their audience and just looking at those two teleprompters. So sometimes that idea of either looking directly above people or picking spots on the wall to look at, sometimes that helps people that, that feel that intimidation. There is the advice, uh, imagine everybody naked, that advice has never helped me. 
Um, I, I don't know whether it helps you. If it does help you, I'd like to know how. I'd like you to share that with me, how, how that helped you, you feel. Um, but I, I, I offer it to you for whatever it may be worth. But my overall suggestion to you, if this is something that you're really struggling with, you're feeling very nervous about, is to have some self-compassion, to, to be compassionate to yourself about it. Recognize that what you're feeling, if you're feeling nervous or scared of by speaking in public, recognize that that's normal, that that's every person has that fear on some level. Even me, and, and there are times where I'm nervous speaking in front of an audience and I've been doing this for close to 20 years in one form or another. It's normal, everybody feels this way. And also know that everyone in your audience is there to support you. They're there because they want you to succeed and do well. No one in the audience is going to heckle you, boo you, throw food at you, say that you did a bad job. Absolutely no one is going to judge you. Everyone there is there to support you and because they want you to succeed. Also keep in mind that you're, you are your own harshest critic in everything that you do. So as I've been speaking now for, for close to an hour, I've been very conscious that I use my hands too much. I've been saying so too many times. My voice is failing. My nose is running. <laughs> I'm very aware of all of these things. I doubt that anyone watching is aware of them to the exact same extent as I am. Some of you have probably picked up on at least a few of the things that I mentioned, and probably some things that I haven't that are also running around in my head. But you are your own harshest critic because you're the only one feeling and experiencing what it is like actually giving the speech. But you're not being judged on how you feel giving a speech. It's on how well you're speaking to others. So the, 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 the thing I tell people in this vein is the, the reason why, if you've ever listened to a recording of yourself and it sounds really weird, and you think, oh my gosh, that's what I actually sound like? That sounds so weird. The reason why that sounds weird to you is because when you are speaking, what you are hearing is not just the sound of your own voice coming out of your mouth. Your inner ear is also picking up on the little vibrations of the bones and muscles and tissues in your head that are between your vocal cords and your mouth and your ears. It's picking up on those little vibrations, things you, you'll never notice, but your ear is, is sensitive enough to notice them. But you're the only one who, whose ear can, can feel those vibrations because your ears are the only ones attached to your, your vocal cords and your mouth. So nobody else is able to feel, have their ears feel those sensations. And that's why to everyone else, you sound perfectly normal. To you, listening to a recording might sound a little weird. To everybody else, you sound perfectly normal. And that's just one biological demonstration of how you are your own harshest critic, why things seem different to you when they seem perfectly normal to someone else. So above all else, know that this is a learning process. Every single person in this process is here to support you and wants you to succeed and wants you to grow and develop as a speaker. And I hope that that gives you some level of comfort as you prepare for this contest and as you work on your speech. Does anyone who is here with me on Zoom have any questions, comments, uh, concerns um, before, we, before we conclude for the evening? Oh, I see one person has a question. Yes, you can absolutely put them in the chat. We will, we will hang out. And, uh, and, and if everyone, um, there, anyone is, is welcome to put a question in the chat, if they would prefer. Sure. So the question was, could you could I repeat the part where I explain the structure of the speech? And very briefly, and again, you can rewind back to uh, the recording if, if you want me to go into it in more detail. Um, but the body paragraph part uh, was the clarification. So the question was, could you 
Could you repeat the part where you explain the structure of the speech like the body paragraph? So the idea, the, the body portion of the speech, that's where most of your speech will be. Your introduction and your conclusion, they are important, but they'll be relatively brief compared to kind of the meat and potatoes of your speech, which is the body. One idea for constructing the body of your speech is to have reasons that support your answer to the question that you're answering. So for example, I'll, I'll use the, um, the, the elementary and middle school topic just as a demonstration. Um, if you were the mayor of Yonkers, what would be your top priority in office and why? And I'll use the example I gave before. Let's say my answer to that question were, my top priority would be to bring a zoo to Yonkers. Let's pretend that was my answer. In the body, if I was doing that kind of five paragraph structure to a speech, what I might want are three reasons why I want to bring a zoo to Yonkers. So my, my first paragraph, again, if in this five paragraph model, my first paragraph might be my first reason, second paragraph might be my second reason, third paragraph might be my third reason. And with each of those paragraphs, with each of those reasons, I would want some kind of support for that reason and support evidence. It can be anything. It can be a news article. It could be an interview with someone, an expert. It could be a movie. It could be a story. It could be literally anything, but some support other than just because I said so, right? Because I am not an expert on why we should have a zoo in Yonkers, but I will give you support, proof for why that's the right thing to do or the best thing to do, why it should be my top priority as mayor of Yonkers. So I'll give that support for each of those reasons. And once I do that, I will explain why that support backs up my reason and why that reason justifies my answer to the question. So in other words, I don't wanna just give support and then just say, so there, that's it. That's why you should do it. Instead, I would want to say, so I'll, I'll make this up just for the sake of an example. Let's pretend I had a, um, a CNN, CNN did a, a story on how great zoos are. Again, I'm just making this up. And I wouldn't wanna just say, so there, CNN said it. So that's why we should have a zoo. Instead, I would wanna go into why what CNN had to say supported my reason for wanting a zoo in Yonkers. I would wanna give that explanation and that justification. And again, all of this, it varies, right? It, it depends on the kind of support that you're using. It depends on the kind of um, reason that you're offering. Um, so what, whatever that explanation might be, um, it, it, it's up to you, right? It, what makes the most sense to you. Now, again, this, this is what, I, what I've just repeated is kind of the, the five paragraph essay sort of model for giving a speech like this. It is not a hard and fast rule, by the way. Maybe you, you just have two reasons, but they require a lot of support and a lot of explanation. That's okay. Maybe you have five reasons. I typically don't go more than three because I, you do also don't want to spread yourself too thin, but you're the artist in this, situ in, this, uh, in this scenario. So maybe you feel like, actually, it's really important for me to go through five reasons. By all means, absolutely do so. Um, so you can you can tweak with it as much as you think, whatever you think is successful, uh, the, the most supportive for you. Uh, and again, you, you can abandon that structure altogether. You might instead say, you know what, I'm going to answer this question, but I'm going to give us, I'm going to tell a story. And by the time I get to that story, there'll be a, a moral or a lesson. And that lesson will, will support the answer to my question. It's a different way of, of giving a speech or of writing a speech, I should say. But it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, so you might feel like that's more effective. And again, you, you might feel like there's a completely different way to write your speech that you think is the most effective way. There's not a, a right or a wrong answer. Um, and again, I encourage you to take a look at some of the resources that we've provided at, at the end of this packet um, and to watch some of the speeches, the sample speeches as well, because I think they, they will all give you some ideas on some of the ways that you can be creative with your speech structure. Um, and by the way, just to, uh, in case anyone uh, was wondering, all of the information in 
this, this packet um, that I put in the chat for those of you here with me on Zoom, the link to which is in the description to this video on YouTube. Um, all this information is on uh, the Yonkers Rotary website, yonkersrotary.org, and the um, Historical Society of the New York Courts website, history.nycourts.gov. Um, so all the, that information is, the, the written information is there as well. So does that uh, answer your question? Um, you can give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, or if, if you have other questions, I'm happy to answer them. We got a thumbs up, wonderful. Sure, another question. How can I captivate my audience with my speech? Like with what phrases? Well, it it depends. Um, to give you, actually, I'll, I'll use that right there as an example. Sometimes when I'm, it, when I'm giving an impromptu speech, something I haven't had a lot of time to prepare, like what I just did, uh, I will give this, I'll start off with this true story. I, I am an attorney. You have to know that in order for this story to work. I say, I had a professor in law school who told me that the right answer to every legal question is always, it depends. And I usually set it up like that. And then it, it works, of course, if my answer to whatever question it is that I'm answering is, it depends. Um, and I, I usually get a laugh out of that because the law is supposed to be complicated, but uh, that there's one right answer to every legal question, no matter what it is, and it is, it depends. Um, that's my one bit of free legal advice for all of you. Whatever legal question you have, the answer is it depends. Um, so that that the reason that that is sometimes captivating is because it's entertaining. It's people are wondering how could there be one one answer to every legal question. Um, so it, it sets up a contradiction. There are uh, a, a few different reasons why that introduction works. So, but that's very personal to me, of course, you know, it, I wouldn't expect that to work for, you know, any of our students in this contest because you haven't gone to law school yet. So the way you captivate your audience at the beginning of your speech and throughout your speech, it, it depends on you. It depends on the content of your speech. Um, it might be a quotation. It might be something someone famous once said. That's a common way to start a, a speech. Um, and if, if that's an idea that appeals to you, you could look for a book of quotes in your library. I'm sure they have some. Um, you might present a statistic. Um, two thirds of all lawyers never see the inside of the courtroom after the day they become lawyers. It's a true statistic. I don't know what speech I would give that to to start off, but that might be an interesting way for me to start a speech. Um, it could be with a story. Um, Yesterday, I started to lose my voice and I thought, well, isn't this perfect? I'm supposed to present a, a, a workshop on a public speaking contest and I'm losing my ability to speak in public. So it, it, there are lots of different ways that you can captivate your audience. Humor in, in general, humor is always a great one. People love to laugh. Um, so humor is always a, a great way to keep your audience's attention. Um, you might look at some some literary devices, wordplay, alliteration, things like that. Um, there are lots of different ways um, that you can, uh, I, I wouldn't say that there's you know, one particular phrase that you can use to get your audience's attention. But I would again suggest, um, take a look, especially at some of the sample speeches, uh, the, the videos in the, um, uh, that, that I put the links to in, in my packet. And, and as you watch those speeches, ask yourself, what is this speaker doing that is keeping my attention, that's captivating my attention? And vice versa. What is this speaker doing that is really boring, that, that I'm not paying attention to? What is this person doing that I don't want to do when I'm delivering a speech? And those might give you some ideas to captivate your audience's attention. Does that help answer your question? Wonderful. Any other questions? And again, this is not the uh, the last time you ever have to hear from me. If you have other questions, you of course can email me speechcontest at yonkersrotary.org. I will follow up with each of you who attended here live to um, share with you the recording as well as a copy of the packet. 
Um, and again, those of you watching on YouTube, you can also email me speechcontest at yonkersrotary.org and you'll have the link to this packet in the description for this video. Are there any other questions from those of you who are here with me on Zoom? All right. Well, thank you all so much for your time. I, I hope that this was helpful and informational. Uh, if, again, you have any questions, you want more information, please don't hesitate to reach out any time. I promise I will do my best to answer every email that I get as quickly as possible. Um, I don't always succeed in achieving that goal, but I absolutely promise I will 100% do my best. So thank you all again so much for your time. Have a wonderful evening. Stay safe and healthy. And I look forward to hearing each of your speeches uh, later this month. Until then, be well. <laughs>